welcome back. In this episode, we're gonna be discussing. And the beehive as a focal point for Masonic meditations. The title, the beehive as a focal point for Masonic meditation, really requires us to address three major areas. First, we must define what Masonic meditation really means, at least in the scope of this video. Then, we must discuss the concept of a focal point. Then, once these two issues are resolved, we can discuss the symbolism of the beehive and how it can be used as a focal point in Masonic meditations. Since the primary focus of this video is on the beehive, we will cover Masonic meditation in an abbreviated format as this study is a major topic on itself. So what do I mean by Masonic meditation? The short answer is meditation on masonry. Therefore, we really have two subtopics to discuss under the heading Masonic meditation. First, what is meditation? And second, what is masonry? Each of these topics is by nature somewhat imprecise and many people will have different ways of approaching these topics. Broadly speaking, meditation comes in a variety of flavors, but this video will only deal with two most fundamental types. There is an empty mind approach to meditation and a concentrated mind approach. There are some that approach one of these meditations only and most of them will say their way is the only legitimate form of med meditation. Others may use both approaches depending upon their objectives. The empty mind approach seeks to empty the mind in order to enter a state of high relaxation or to become receptive. In some respect, this technique is somewhat along the lines of speak Lord, your student listens. This task is far more difficult than might initially be supposed. The mind constantly wants to fill the void of the empty mind with stray thoughts that seem to enter of their own volution. It may take several minutes for the mind to calm down and even then random thoughts can intrude into the silence. There is truly a discipline required to calm the mind and keep it quiet and open. Mastering this skill can potentially help the mason to rapidly calm the mind in crisis situations. But this approach raises the question, open the mind for what? How does the mason know the random thought that creates in was not a message for which he calmed and opened his mind? But one of the purposes of the open mind technique is to listen. How do we know what we are listening for and how to separate it from the noise when we hear it? Perhaps at first the goal of the new Masonic meditator is simply to clear the mind and learn to master his thoughts. As such, the Mason seeks to hear nothing. Rather, the Mason seeks mastery over both conscious and subconscious thoughts and to be simply able to enter into the void of calm. Once this mastery is obtained, the Mason is then able to perhaps ask a question and then empty the mind to listen for the answer. Perhaps the answer to knowing the answer from a random thought lies in knowing yourself. The concentrated mind approach takes a different route. Here, the mason focuses upon a specific object or symbol and concentrates all thoughts, both conscious and subconscious, upon it. As thoughts appear in the mind, the mason either relates them to a symbol or banishes them. The goal of this form of meditation is in two folds. 
first just like the empty mind approach it teaches discipline whilst the empty mind approach seeks avoid the concentrated mind seeks intense concentration upon one specific symbol but in both cases they seek to gain discipline and control over the mind but why does the mason seek to do this the simple answer is to lead a masonic life the more complex answer is to lead a masonic life so what then is a masonic life here again the same answer is both complex and simple i think a masonic life is one led in accordance with the tenets of brotherly love relief and truth this is at once both simple and profound it is very simple to speak the words brotherly love, relief, truth. It is something perhaps different to completely ingrain these principles within your life. So virtually every action and thought is in accordance with them. I think most fundamental exoteric truths are very simple. But this simplicity is deceptive. Whilst the concepts are quite simple, their mastery is difficult. By the same token, because the concepts sound so simple, it is often dismissed. That's why Jesus called it the narrow way. Very narrow, very simple, often dismissed. Perhaps this is the true meaning of the alchemist's statement that once again the philosopher's stone is all around us and we dismiss it because it is common perhaps sometimes we need to take a complex journey in order to appreciate what we find at the end the simple may in fact be more complex than what at first seems complex in order to understand the simple perhaps we have to delve into its parts separate them and analyze them then put them back together again into cohesive whole this is the alchemical process of solve et coagula so what does this mean to masonry and the masonic life consider for a moment how we act and feel in lodge it is such a different space really a different mindset when we enter the lodge we change somewhat we become more aware of masonry and what masonry really means virtually everything we do in the lodge is dictated by the tenant of masonry leading the masonic life means we never leave the lodge we take the lord with us wherever we go in the entered apprentice degree we are told to make use of it for the more noble and glorious purpose of divesting our hearts and our consciousness of all the vices and superfluities of life, thereby fitting our minds as living stones for that spiritual building, that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Perhaps what we do in Masonic meditation is to create a virtual lodge that we take with us wherever we go. The mason builds this lodge stone by stone and dwells in it always. The mason that masters the builder's act develops a state of consciousness that is always operative, employing the tenant of our act. Perhaps that is why the tools are called working tools. We use them to build the virtual lodge in our minds. But how do we use these tools, one may ask. The ritual tells us, at least partially, how to use them. In the fellowcraft degree, we are told, tools and instruments of architecture and symbolic emblems most expressive are selected by the fraternity to imprint upon the mind wise and serious truth, and therefore through a succession of ages are transmitted unimpaired unimpaired the most excellent tenant of our institution 
these tools imprint upon the mind certain certain truths so how do they do this and what are these truths i think the process of imprinting upon the mind is the process of focused masonic meditation by focusing upon the tools and symbolic emblems most expressive we gain insight into their use we can also link concepts to them when we imprint powerful images in our mind it allows us to do two things first the process of meditation on these symbols and the concept we attach to them will change our lives as their truths are ingrained into our mind and we build the lodge second we create images that we can call up throughout the day as required when we call up these images we immediately bring into consciousness their lessons and applications those concepts that we have linked to the symbols for example recall the meaning of the compasses we are taught in the entered apprentice degree the teachers to circumscribe our desires and to keep our passions in due bound now if we have truly imprinted this image and lessons on our mind in times of strife and conflict we will feel ourselves losing control of our passions we can call this image up in our mind and use it to compose ourselves but this does not come easily it does not come from simple hearing the lesson in the lodge rather it comes from focused meditation the building of the virtual lodge then it comes from unfocused observation of our daily lives that is being conscious of what we are doing at all moments and having capacity to, to alter our conduct this is far easier said than done how many of us do something or say something then immediately wish we had not or when asked why we did something can only shrug our shoulders and say we do not know these are examples of living our lives in an unconscious rather than fully conscious state many if not most people spend most of their lives in an unconscious state the virtual lodge is a state of heightened perpetual consciousness let me now try to illustrate this process with one of the masonic emblems from the master mason's degree the beehive the beehive symbol operates on multiple levels from the physical to the sublime thus as we contemplate them in masonic meditation we shall dive into the various levels of the symbols immersing ourselves in each level we identify and work through an understanding of it as we contemplate one level of symbolism it leads us to the other levels that we have not originally identified climbing the ladder you gotta take the step it leads you to the next there may be long periods of free association and linkage of symbols with other symbols then our task is to integrate the various levels of the symbols into cohesive whole as we progress through the levels perhaps we should ask ourselves questions about how the meaning we investigate affects our lives as we contemplate the answers to these questions then perhaps we can identify concepts that we want to link to the symbols and issues that we want to work out within our lives let us start with the physical level of the beehive symbol first let us imprint its form and texture upon our mind our goal is to be able to see the beehive in our mind's eye. We want to be able to call the image up as well and see all of its details. We want the image to be so clear that we can touch the beehive, feel its form and texture, and hear the bees as they fly in and out of the hive and taste the sweet honey it contains. As we contemplate the beehive's form, we begin to notice several things. First, consider the dome shape. Perhaps this shape is an axe spawn about its vertical axis. Consider the form of a dome 
and how the inward pressure is applied precisely so it supports itself if this pressure is not balanced the dome would collapse like the arc there is a center point in the dome in which all comes together in the arc this is the keystone can we find it and use it to balance this dome what is the keystone of our life is it that simple substance that is often rejected second consider the three images shown the first is the beehive the second is an omphalos a delphi and the third is the soka from ancient egypt notice that all three have similar dome shape perhaps this shape is part of the key of the symbol itself and we can bring in this images and their concept into our meditation the unfallen stone means the naval stone it was meant to mark the center of the world the stone at Delphi was sighted at the place where two birds that Zeus sent to circle the world met together. Many of the ancient temples had a naval stone or a foundation stone that served this purpose. Notice that the soca from Egypt has two birds on it. As we reflect on the virtual lodge or temple that we create, we begin to see that it is for us the center of the world. Thus, the beehive sits in our temple as it unfollows. What is the center of our lives? Now consider that the beehive is a repository for honey and the home of bees. Honey is a sticky, sweet substance. It is also a preservative and does not spoil. Honey made thousands of years ago still retains its qualities. It is made from the nectar of flowers that may be seen as a product of the sun. Bees somehow seek out the flowers that allow them to make this honey, find their way back into the hive, and then communicate to other bees the flower's location. They always return home and share what they have found. Do we seek out the sweet nectar of life and share it? Finally, look at its texture. It appears to be made from a rope. In fact, this form of the beehive is made from one continuous cord. Perhaps this cord can be related to the cable tow. If so, our omphalos is made from our cable tow. What does it say about its length? Does the honey it contains affect its use? Now, let us move to the next level of symbolism. The brief mention of the beehive in our ritual, we are told <clears throat> the beehive is an emblem of industry and recommends the practice of that virtue of all created beings. So we should ever be industrious ones, never sitting down contented whilst our fellow creatures around us are in want. When it is in our power to relieve them without inconvenience to ourselves. That's all we are told. The rest is up to us. As we meditate upon the beehive, we should also meditate upon what this passage tells us. I think there are three important aspects to the above explanation. 1. Humanity is a rational and intelligent creature. 2. Each human should use this gift. 3. The purpose of our labor is to help create heaven on earth. As we reflect on the first part, perhaps we may relate it to the theme of the development of consciousness. In this light, humanity is not as a flawed and a fallen creature. Rather, we are intelligent and capable of making rational and conscious choices. Are we rational and conscious or do we allow our passions to dominate our actions? The second part relates to industry. How should we use this gift? How we fit into the order of the cosmos and what is our part in it? What is the part laid out on the trestle board for our labor? How do we relate to the grand architect to understand our part in the plan? The final part relates to carrying out this labor and to mention of both heaven and earth. I think the task of each mason is to help make earth more like heaven. We see this in two ways. 
with the symbol and explanation of the beehive. First, the explanation says we are never to sit down whilst our fellow creatures are in want. We are charged with the responsibility, which is echoed in the Masonic tenet of relief. Second, the beehive is the omphalos of the Mason's virtual lodge. The lodge or the temple is the link between heaven and earth. As we become the lodge, perhaps we also become part of that linkage. What kind of linkage points are we? What do we communicate by our thoughts and our actions or our inactions? The omphalos is the linkage between what is above and what is below what is below as well as the center. This is also seen in the Masonic symbol of the circle with the point, bordered by two parallel perpendicular lines and the interlocked square and compasses. The point, circle and lines represent the center and that which connects two poles. The interlocked square and compasses create a form of the vesica pistol which traditionally has represented the linkage between above and below. The oblong diamond created by the intersection of the square and compasses is also integral to the geometry of the Vesica pieces. Now, let us see if we can explore the beehive on some further levels, connecting it to other images. In the Fellowcraft ritual, we are told of the three wages of a Fellowcraft. In the Master Mason's ritual, we are told of the wages of a Master, but they are never defined. The wages of the Fellowcraft are corn, wine, and oil, but we need to ask ourselves why these wages? Do they come from a specific source or mean anything beyond what the new Fellowcraft is told? If we turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 31 in the Bible, we find these are part of the wages of the priestly class. This chapter tells us the people were to set aside the first fruits of grain, wine, and honey for the priests, so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Here, we find the three wages of the fellow craft, plus one other, honey. Why is honey left out in the fellow craft degree? Is it somehow different than the others? The first of the wages, grain, can be likened to the body. We can see this in several mythic systems with corn gods and other aspects of fertility. Hiram Abif may be likened to one of these corn gods in some senses. The word used for corn in the Hebrew text is interestingly, the word is also the name for a fish like deity, Dagon worshipped in the ancient Middle East. The fish god are often the givers of civilization. We can see this in Virat culture in the New World, Dagon, Onis, E, and others in the Old World. The Vesica Pisces is the fresh. Terse, in grain, we may also see a mastery of the body that is controlled over its impulses. How well do we control our impulses? The second wage, wine, can be likened perhaps to the emotions. The Hebrew word for wine used in the passage is This word can perhaps be translated as new wine Freshly squeezed grape juice that has not been fermented yet Rather than fermented wine This distinction is perhaps important on an exoteric level The new wine has the potential to be wine Likewise, since it is not fermented It has a far lower probability of being an intoxicant one can drink it and not lose control. Thus, with corn and new wine, we perhaps circumscribe our desires and keep our passions in due bounds. Do we control our emotions or do they control us? The third wage, oil, can perhaps be likened to knowledge or perhaps consciousness. The Hebrew word for oil can imply the meaning shrine. Here we see the concept of light. Light is, after all, what the Mason desires. If we engage in a little play with the word, which I think many extraterrestrials do, we find something perhaps interesting. If we remove the H, we have R-J-Y. This can have a figurative meaning of conception, thought, or mind. Thus, we may link light, which is symbolic of knowledge, and the mind symbolically to the oil. 
is our mind a brightly burning lamp or the wing shrivel and a distance from the oil so is the wages of a fellow craft perhaps we have mastery of the body the emotions and the mind let us now return to honey perhaps the wages of the master mason are the wages of the fellow craft plus honey so what of honey recall that Honey is a preservative as well as a sweetener. Honey also comes from a hexagon shaped cell. The hexagon can be seen as the interior of two interlaced triangles. The hexagram. This was used by extraterrestrials to indicate a linking of two concepts. Perhaps as seen in the emerald tablet or as seen above, so below the linkage of heaven and earth. It is essential the same symbol as the vesica paces and thus linked to the interlock square and compasses as well. One of the roles of the temple is to serve as the linkage point between heaven and earth. Perhaps the first temple deliberately constructed by the Sumerian Duranki, which literally means born heaven and earth. We may perhaps see in the Masonic degrees the transformation of the Mason into a temple. In that light, Perhaps the symbolic payment of corn, wine, oil, and honey to the master mason can be interesting. The first three help to build a temple and the last makes the mason a priest in his own temple. Thus, perhaps honey is emblematical of the spirit, the divine presence in us. It is this presence that makes life sweet and preserves it after death. Death is an important symbolic part of the Master Mason degree. After a symbolic death, the Master Mason is raised upon the lion's paw. So how does the beehive relate to the Master Mason degree? Perhaps an insight into the answer can be found in the Bible. In Judges chapter 14 verse 8, And he, Samson, turned aside to see the carcass of the lion and behold there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion both samson and the lion are solar in nature the name samson is directly related to the hebrew word for the sun which in turn is related to the mesopotamian solar deity shamas the lion is often used as a symbol of the sun throughout many cultures the sun is clearly important in masonry. There is also anecdotal evidence that in many of the ancient mysteries, the candidate personified the sun. The sun was seen to die and be risen both at the end of the day and at the winter solstice. Perhaps in the death of the lion, we have the birth of something else. So what of the bee, the lion and the rising? The bee and the lion are linked by more than just the passage from Judges. One of the key symbols of Mithraism was a lion with a bee in its mouth. In the lion degree of Mithraism, the initiates used honey to wash his hands and anoint his tongue. Porphyry, a Neoplatonic philosopher, wrote, but when the patient, uh, he was referring to the rites of the Mithras, but when the patient offers honey to the guardian of fruit, they regard its preserving power as a symbol of its similitude to the divine nature. Porphyry also tells us that souls were likened to bees and says, souls are indeed the authors of all the pleasures peculiar to our nature. Some philosophers also related the soul to the bee because the bee constantly goes about the world and then returns to its home. Porphyry then explains that the priestesses of Ceres, as ministers to the Tyrian goddess, were formerly called bees, and that her daughter, Prosephine, was called Miltitoad, or delicious, alluding to the sweetness of honey. He also tells us the ancient related the bee to the bull and to the moon. The bee and the honey are thus symbolic of the soul and our divine nature. This is perhaps echoed in Genesis chapter 1 verses 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. If so, this nature is sweet rather than bitter. 
and reflect our rational and inte intelligent nature we are told of in the Masonic explanation of the beehive. How well do we reflect that image? Is our mirror brightly polished or is it clouded and hidden? With the references from Judges and Forfe, we find the juxtaposition of the lion and oxen bull. The lion is the symbol of the sun and the bull the symbol of the moon. There are two poles, perhaps reflecting the conscious and the, con and the subconscious minds. Robert H. Brown in Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy says, the two pillars in masonry are associated with the sun, Boaz, and the moon, Jekyll. The bull and the moon have been represented together often in conflict. Since ancient antiquity, they have also been paired to form gates. Perhaps the balance of conflicting forces to create a gate echoes the balance of forces inherent in the dome. If we return again, the cave of the nymphs, Homer and Porphyry tell us the cave has two openings. The one in the north is for humanity to descend into and the one in the south is for the immortals to ascend from. He tells us this cave is a symbol of the world and that it has two openings. One in the north through which mortals descend and one in the south from which immortals ascend. He likens this gate to the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. He then tells us Plato calls them two gates. Of these, they affirm that Cancer is the gate through which souls descend, but Capricorn, that through which they ascend and exchange a material for the divine condition of being. Precipi, often called the beehive as well as the manger, is located in the constellation Cancer. Here, then, we see a representation of Beth in Cancer reinforcing the image of cancer as a symbol of birth. Perhaps the beehive then can be seen as the manger or womb of the soul. If the beehive is the omphalos of our temple, this may be an apt image. That the bee comes from the carcass of the lion in Judges perhaps tells this is the rebirth of the soul after the physical death. Let us now turn again to the symbol of the point, circle, and the two parallel perpendicular lines. The two lines we are told in the ritual represent the Holy Saint John. These two saints in turn represent the two soul steps, which are marked by the two tropics. The circle with the point can represent the sun itself. The symbol is both the alchemical symbol for the sun and the Egyptian hieroglyph Fidelia. In Jesus Christ, Son of God writes, in Greek sacred geography, the symbol one represents the central omphalos. These lines can perhaps also represent competing forces within our lives that we seek to balance. Much of the imagery of the lion and bull can convey how well do we balance the forces of our lives? Have we opened ourselves to our subconscious mind in order to know ourselves better? Now consider the directions we use in the Masonic ritual. In Masonry, we are told the North is the place of darkness. It is the reminiscence of the womb and hence of birth. The moon is its light and the moon is linked to the menstrual cycle and hence to birth. This seems to tie to the northern entrance of the cave. The South is a place of light. The sun in the south is exalted in its glory. Perhaps this is the reborn soul ascending from the cave. We can also compare this to the Egyptian idea of the soul and river as they linked it to the sun. The sun descended into the underworld in the north. This ties in the Soka image shown above. The Soka image was associated with the Memphis necropolis and the Epis bull. In Latin, the word for B is Epis. Thus, another symbolic linkage to the B and the bull that echoes what Pope told us. The god Ta was also associated with the Soka and was part of the tribe of the Soka Pat Osiris. He was called the master builder and was associated with building and architecture. His wife was Skepme, the lion-headed goddess. Ta 
was also closely associated with man who often can be likened as a personification of truth and justice thus through an exploration of the soca symbol we find symbolic links to the grand architect of the universe and the masonic tenets of justice were we reborn by our master mason rising has this birth created the beehive that is our navel stone and balanced all the forces within our lives is this the birthplace and home of our soul and the source of our cable toe? Is the cable toe now different after that master mason degree? To complete our journey through layers of symbolism, let us return to the honey. The reason for the beehive, honey is sticky and sweet. It preserves and purifies. Perhaps this is an apt symbol for love, for love seems to possess these qualities as well. Let us now recall the working tools of the master mason, the trowel. The trowel is used to spread the cement which unites the stones of the building. The master mason ritual tells us this cement is symbolic of brotherly love and affection. Perhaps this cement is represented by honey, honey which is produced in the beehive, which is the omphalos or centerpiece of our virtual lodge and the birthplace of our soul. And through the symbol of the bee, which makes the honey, we are connected to the master architect. We are perhaps the living embodiment of the temple, which joins heaven and earth. How well do we shape our lives? So we are a linkage point between heaven and earth. Does our symbolic bee seek out the flowers that it then turns into honey in the hive? What are these flowers that we use to create our honey? Perhaps it rests upon each mason. To delve in the queries of the soul and the mind to gain self-knowledge in order to build virtual lodge and place the infamous within it this i think is the purpose of masonic meditation we reflect upon the symbols of the craft and explore their various levels of meaning in deep meditation as part of this process we examine our life and how we live in it and relate to the rest of the cosmos. In this process, we learn something about both the cosmos and ourselves. And in the process, perhaps we hear that still voice that seeks to instruct us. Perhaps this is the journey of the bee to the flower. Thank you for joining us. Leave your comments below and let us know what your thoughts are on Masonic meditations and what you've learned from this video, what we can do to improve. Like, subscribe, share the video to other Masons and friends alike.